Good afternoon, everyone. I have a fetish for starting on time. I recognize that some people may yet be drifting in, but the time is now, and therefore I'm going to start. <laughs> and so I want to give you a couple of reminders before I do. We have Ms. Foley present with us. And Ms. Foley is the captain of the evaluation ship. And she has forms she's going to pass out. And she wants you to evaluate the presentation and return those to her at its end. If there are any students present who are going to or want to seek credit for attending, she also has the forms for that. So contact her to get the form for class credit and you'll be all set to go. With those preliminaries out of the way, with those preliminaries out of the way, oh, that sounds so much better, doesn't it? <laughs> you can hear me. Do I, have to, do I have to repeat what I said before? <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> with those preliminaries out of the way, then I want to open this presentation with a disclaimer. I have come merely to give you the opportunity to relax. So I'm not going to put anything up on the projector. I don't have any games for you to play. I don't have any entertainment for you at all. I really just want to have a conversation with you about this important subject. Now I'm going to take just a few minutes to relate to you a context for our conversation. Then I want to have the conversation with you. So I say to you, I come to sing your praises, though not to praise your singing. So let me make clear where I stand. In 2007, I was present at the Denver campus for the system summit. At that summit, I came, of course, from Michigan State University, where I worked at the time, and I delivered a presentation which emphasized the importance of inclusiveness. In fact, I emphasized it so strongly, I urged people to make that the preferred term over all other terms for addressing the critical social problems that confronted us then, had confronted us for a long time before then, and continue to confront us today. In the course of those remarks, I was very specific about the kinds of undertakings that would be necessary to create a genuinely inclusive university community. My remarks, which I subsequently published, were structured to cover not just universities, but agencies of all forms. But I focused in on universities in particular because universities have a special mission. And when I say I come not to praise your singing, it's because you sing in two or more verses and not one verse. And I think the difference between university and diversity is important. And that we must remember that it actually means something. It is important for us to begin with the central mission of the university every single time we undertake any conversation about what's taking place in higher education. And that central mission is very simply stated. It is the pursuit of truth with open-ended inquiry. That affirmation is so critical to assure that everything we do works to fulfill the mission of the university, that the song we sing ought always to begin with it and end with it. So I sing your praises for what has happened in the decades since I was here, for genuinely CU has embedded inclusiveness in its practices and its expectations. But it hasn't begun to sing the song quite the way I want it sung yet. And as any good composer, I have a key signature at the start of this composition, and I want it to be respected. <laughs> to be more precise, and again, very brief, I'll just remind you of things that I said then, and I'm only going to remind you of two things. One, I made a series of specific recommendations. And I think it is fair to say that CU has measured up very well alongside most of those specific recommendations. In fact, I would find only one still remaining to be satisfied at the level that I expected. And I will just say what that was. And that was to increase by orders of magnitude outreach in order to feed the streams of participation in the university. To increase by orders of magnitude outreach, whether admissions or appointment. That there has been emphasis on our outreach is clear. 
that it has not been increased by orders of magnitude is also clear. And therefore, I have to say, I find fault with that. But so much else has been done well. For example, when I speak of changing policies and practices, this is what I said then. Uh, it, it is highly desirable that public agencies and universities recalibrate their programs, beginning with refocusing on their specific missions, and in the case of the university, on the core pursuit of truth and circumstances of open-ended inquiry. Every policy and practice must reinforce the integrity of the institutional mission within the confines of standards of fairness and equality. So, number one, I think there is a fair approximation of that. Secondly, I said, they should review the extent to which administrative approaches for fostering inclusion serve to reinforce the core mission by visibly identifying persons who may be aptly seen as mission experts in positions of authority and oversight. Well, there certainly has been a ramping up of staff to oversee the process, whether it has indeed completely risen to the standard I set forth, I will leave for you to assess. But in relation to that second, I also said the over-reliance upon affirmative action officers who are not necessarily steeped in the culture of the agency or institution is not calculated to show due deference and respect for the institutional mission. Then thirdly, I observe, policies that serve to separate out community members rather than to integrate them uh, ought to be abandoned and replaced by practices that work hand in glove with self-motivation to profit from a breadth of opportunity consistently offered and made highly visible. And that's an area in which we must be excruciatingly precise. In our conversation, we can ask more about what that means. I think there's room for development on that front. As to positive commands for inclusiveness, I listed six things. Vigorous outreach was the first. The second was clear and transparent admission and appointment standards, published and open to public view. Clear and transparent admission and appointment standards, published and open to public review. Secondly, or thirdly, institutionalized mentoring and evaluation procedures designed to strengthen performance relative to agency or institutional mission. That one was based on research, which I also published with this particular essay, demonstrating the great weaknesses in most institutions in any strong mentoring in order to improve performance in the aftermath of vigorous efforts of affirmative action or other programs of inclusiveness. Fourthly, I call for transparent adherence to agency or institutional identity as the primary ground of adhesion in the particular agency or institution. Unpack that. I say, what counts is what the university is there for and the individual's pre pre preparation to participate in it. Identifying people as integral to what we do is the best way to show respect for them. And we shouldn't reverse that relationship. Fifth, I said reinforcement of legal guarantees as an institutional commitment rather than as an evasion of liability. I don't say that happened at CU, but I can tell you I know very many places where people follow legal standards to evade liability rather than to accomplish positive purposes and I will leave you to discern how far you fall on one side or the other of that particular spectrum. Finally, I said scale bids or requests for proposals to attract the participation of modest enterprises. Now this is one of the most difficult things in most agencies I'm familiar with. For it is reasonable that people want to deal with experienced contractors. It is reasonable that they want people who have a record are producing excellently, but it's also important to scale those expectations in a way that people who can no less serve the purposes of excellence can nevertheless compete with modestly scaled operations. So those were the six positive commands that I suggested, and I ask whether in fact any or all are relevant to what's happening at CU. Now finally, I want to share with you a case study which focuses in on the question of affirmative action, though I understand affirmative action is not exhausted of the conversation. And that's one of the things for which I sing the praises of CU. You have moved beyond 
that rather simple-minded understanding of what it means to integrate broadly in the community people from varying backgrounds. And the case study I want to share with you comes from an Eastern University, not from CU, so relax. <laughs> I have to turn to the page that has the case study on it because I want to give it to you exactly as I reported it. And it should be, oh, that's not quite it. Well, let me just begin to characterize it for you even as I search for it. There was an Eastern University uh, political science department which was searching to make an appointment. And what I want you to do is to assess the way they went about trying to make this appointment and then to ask the question whether it could be handled any better at CU. And I know I have it in these pages somewhere, but I cannot, oh, no, that's not it either. I cannot find it here as quickly as I would like, but I should move my pages too quickly, I suppose. Well, just bear with me because that's the last thing I have to do and now I've found it. Okay, good. The uh, case study is this. This is a garden variety case that occurred back about the time that I came to see you. The following scenario took place. It was a highly reputed East Coast University. The political science department met to deliberate on candidates for an American pol politics position. The search committee reported 10 candidates from a large pool, all of whom were qualified for the position, and at least six of whom were good fits. Policy and practice called for the department at large to select three of the candidates for on-campus interviews. The department decided to employ its usual method of deciding by vote using what political scientists call the border method. This method entails a secret ballot on which voters rank all candidates from one top choice to ten last choice. That produces a numerical tally in which the lowest number reveals the highest rank and so on to the end. The top three candidates are invited to campus. The department favored the scheme over the Australian preference ballot, which calls for extended repeat balloting. The tally produced the following results. Number one, white female, degree in hand, top 50 school. Number two, white male, degree expected imminently, top 50 school. Number three, white male, degree in hand, top 50 school. Number four, white male, apparently Jewish, degree in hand, top 50 school. Number five, black female, degree expected, intermediate range, top 50 school. At this point, the chair moved to send the results to the approving dean to extend the three invitations to campus. A faculty member moved, however, that the department request authorization to invite candidate number five, plus the three additional candidates by rank. Some faculty favored the motion for explicit affirmative action diversity reasons and noted that candidate number four would not be invited anyway, and so was not being harmed. At least one faculty member objected to using race to move one candidate ahead of a higher rank candidate after the fact. The faculty decided, however, to proceed with candidate number five as one of four invitees if permitted. This is a real case. The notable dynamics of which are instructive. To take the least obvious first, candidate number five, had no idea of what had happened and would only have known if receiving an offer and accepting the job, she exercised the reasonable prudence of catching up with her new colleagues by reading department minutes for the past year. The facts I relate come directly from department minutes. At that moment, she would have confronted the now conceded stigma effect of race and gender preferences and warned an assigned badge of inferiority. Secondly, these faculty were all political scientists whom we may be sure were fully informed about the legal requirements of what they were doing and who knew, therefore, that they had just violated the law on a number of grounds. To take only the most obvious, the 2003 Grutter Gratz decisions resulted in a twofold test of racial considerations. When they involve extra points for race, they are illegal. 
when race is illegitimately referenced, it is only in a holistic, pardon me, when race is legitimately referenced, it is only in a holistic assessment, which has to mean that it comes in before the fact of summary evaluation. That the files were weighed, assessed, and judged before the race move was made places this case on the prohibited grant side of the scale. Thirdly, it is important to observe that the supposed beneficiary of preferences in this case not only doubtlessly qualified for the position, but more importantly was someone who, on someone else's list in some other institution, would certainly come in number one instead of number five. However, she will not be aware of the distinction as she interviews for the jobs and could well end up mismatched with colleagues who believe her to be inferior rather than joining colleagues who have the highest expectations for her. In other words, what the ratings signify is only the best judgment of the faculty involved rather than anything expressly objective concerning the candidates themselves. Accordingly, to think of candidate number five as inferior in ability is a mistake, even though it was precisely what the faculty in this case happened to think. This makes perfectly clear that stereotypical thinking about black people does not happen only in the case of supposed rednecks. Instead, it is even more current today among supposed progressives. The outcome. The candidate agreed to interview for the job. In the actual process, a different candidate was preferred and offered the job. However, the deciding university official decided to offer a job anyway, one created for the purpose, to candidate number five. That was the second level preference judgment made in this case, now following a second judgment that the candidate was inferior. Fortunately, candidate number five, for whatever reasons, declined the offer. Had she not done so, she would have found herself working with colleagues, hoping for a tenured appointment in six years, where they began with the expectation that she would not likely attain it, and where she would hardly have been favored with the kind of mentoring that colleagues from whom one expects the most would receive. She would have been placed in a most unfavorable situation, all based on the operation of the embedded social practice of making judgments on the basis of race and or gender rather than qualifications. So that final reference to embedded social practice is a concept that I developed when I was here before and at length in that paper, which says we have certain social reflexes and they are not always helpful. And sometimes they create perverse circumstances that actually harm people. They harm people under the pretense of helping them. So I ask you, think about this case study I just read to you. Could that happen at CU? I have a microphone here, by the way. This is a conversation, because I'm done. I might make some more observations, but I also want you to make observations and raise questions. And let's talk about what's happened over the course of the last decade. So, could that happen at CU? Who would answer? I don't know the answer. I'm depending on you. That's, this is a retrospective. I'm here to ask, <laughs> what is the status? What's going on here? I hope this is turned on. Yes, I think it is it. I can't tell. You tell me. Harris <laughs> Mollock, um, CU Anschutz. It's not on. Uh, push, push the button. Push the button. Okay. Um, my name is Harris Mollock. I'm at CU Anschutz. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say that it could happen at least at the medical school, mm -hmm. um, where we go through residency recruitment, where students are then ranked on the number system that you uh, laid out. And assessed um, in that way. Of course, these are closed door. Um, rankings are based with pictures for reference so doctors can remember mm -hmm. who the candidate is. And usually when you bring in a resident, it is with the expectation that if they do not stay for a fellowship and go somewhere else that you would want to recruit them later. Uh, so. Okay, uh, anybody else want to comment on that? I mean, this is important, and we should talk about it, and we should ask, is it harmful or helpful? Uh, and I serve on the board of a hospital system, and I have to look at applications from uh, graduates of medical schools with fellowships all the time. And I want you to know, when I'm assessing those, I'd be concerned if those appointment requests were coming to me on that basis. I'd want to know 
that each candidate was being evaluated properly on the candidate's strength and not on the basis of the candidate's accidents or attributes. So if that could happen at CU, then I'm going to continue singing your praises for what I've seen, but I'm going to moderate my song. I'm going to say there's work to do. And that's the question. After all, the last sign I see when I leave the parking garage over here at the, at the Memorial Center says, be inclusive. And it lifts my heart every time I see it. Be inclusive. That's what my recommendation is. I want us to be inclusive. But I don't want inclusive to build in prejudices. I don't want the inclusiveness to make matters worse rather than better. I don't want the inclusiveness to separate people rather than to bring people together. And so it's an important question, just how inclusive are we being? What is transpiring? We have to ask ourselves those questions. In every dimension of the university, there is an evaluation procedure. We ask people to state what the objectives of their mission are. We ask them to lay out goals to meet those objectives. We ask to evaluate them at the end. With respect to our program of inclusion, we have to evaluate it as well. We have to be very clear exactly how it is being pursued and what it means to make that a value in the context of the university. Let me give you one example. And as I said, I want this to be a conversation, so I'm going to ask you to react to this example also. There's a lot of conversation today about implicit bias. You will hear it. You've probably heard it several times already in the course of this summit, and we'll hear more before it's done. And people are concerned to remove implicit bias. They ask, is there something we can do in organizing our systems and institutions that will allow us to neutralize the effect of implicit bias? Now, here's the thing. Implicit bias is occasioned by unconscious biases. Well, that's the official description of it. I, I can show you a, a recent account, which reads like this. Bias is found in the amygdala, which is also associated with the fear or with the fear or the fight or flight notion. Basic information about individuals and social stereotypes are stored in the temporal lobes. First impressions, empathy, and reasoning are associated with the frontal cortex. Acknowledging that we all have biases is the first step towards reducing our reliance on generalizations or stereotypes. All sounds pretty benign, doesn't it? I mean, this is science, this is medicine. But of course, it all means that the attempt to, what? Cure the amygdala? Perhaps lobotomize the temporal lobes? Or whatever we're going to do with the frontal cortex? Well, you know, practicing medicine without a license is a crime. And if this is all unconscious and requires psychoanalytic intervention, that's the practice of medicine. Is that what we're doing? Is that what it's all about at the university? Are we practicing medicine without a license when we assail implicit bias? Let's put it in another context. I said open-ended inquiry for the pursuit of truth, which means overcoming prejudices. So I'm asking, what's the difference between prejudice and implicit bias? What's the difference in the context of the university? Anybody? We need to confront this. Now that we've put aside all of the PowerPoint projections, and now that we've settled down at the end of the day, we need to ask the question that we were asked when we registered for this conference. What do we expect to learn? I'm asking you. What do you expect to learn? What do you know about implicit bias? How do you think it should be handled? Is there such a thing that is meaningfully discussed? Or should we just revert to the discussion of prejudice? Good. <laughs> I think that all the issue with implicit bias is that sometimes it's, it appears to be benign from the surface, 
but it's just as insidious and negative as, as somebody who's outright either sexist or, of, or um, mm -hmm. racist, because the outcome is the same, in my view. Mm -hmm. So I think confronting it is good. It just kind of pointed like, we mm -hmm. need to do something about it, because sometimes people think, oh, he didn't really mean it. But, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, when you say, so hold nice. the mic for a moment. When you, when you say they're just the same. Which, the, oh, which, the outcomes. Well, yeah. outcomes, yes. consequences. <laughs> Is the approach to them the same? That's the question that's being asked. You know, we, we can pass laws against overt discrimination, can't we? So, so what do we do about tacit discrimination? Do we pass a law against that too? Yeah, I think it, we have to be a little bit more creative, uh, but more importantly than creative, I think we have to be more courageous to call it when it happens. Okay. Yes, go right ahead. You know, someone told me a while ago mm -hmm. that in order to connect people and overcome that kind of fear or bias is to look at someone and think of three things that you have similarities with. Mm -hmm. And I think that really connected with me. So mm -hmm. when I see a person now, I feel like I can actually connect with them on a true human <laughs> level. Sorry, I didn't come yeah. up with the right word for that. But <laughs> That's good. Very good. Mm -hmm. Someone else. But let's solve the problem. We're here. We only have a few minutes. This is our opportunity. Let's solve the problem. Somebody here has the answer, I'm sure. Who's going to offer it? Great. I don't think I have the answer, but um, <laughs> I think that there is a lot of unlearning that has to okay. happen um, at all levels um, because, like you said, like things don't become institutionalized overnight. It's a period of hundreds of years that these things have happened, so we have to continuously chip away at it um, and kind of take things one step at a time because a lot of people, like you said, it's unconscious, so they don't even realize it. And so part of that is just exposing people to that idea that it exists, and then going from there once you've opened people's eyes so that yeah. they can see it around them. Okay. That's a very helpful response, and I want somebody else to be thinking of a response too, but let me comment on that response for a moment. The, uh, the, the fact is, when we speak of implicit bias as something unconscious that's somehow rooted in the amygdala or the frontal cortex or some lobe or other, uh, that's effectively saying it grows in the body. Uh, she says it happens over hundreds of years. And, and therefore she underscores something different, not that it's like a cancer, a foreign body that enters us and harms the innocent by growing there, but that it enters by way of indoctrinations of some sort or the other. It is not, therefore, a foreign body that attaches itself, but a body of ideas that are cultivated. I use the word cultivated directly, i.e., we have the term culture because of the meaning of the term cultivated. As gardens are cultivated, then so are social conceptions and ideas. And so it is possible people may have prejudices that have been cultivated over time. In fact, I guarantee you, people have prejudices that have been cultivated over time. But I don't know that it helps the conversation to label those prejudices implicit biases, to create a pseudo-scientific analysis of them, rather than to describe the human dynamic in human terms. Because if we describe the human dynamic in human terms, two things result. We can consult human responses to it, rather than looking for clinical responses, rather than looking for experts who are going to save us from ourselves. That's vitally important. Secondly, describing them in human terms means we deal with the people that we want to deal with as human beings. We show respect for their humanity. We do not treat them as lab specimens. We treat them as people of whom we expect better when they perform ill. And that is showing respect for their humanity. In the same way that we show respect for people's humanity when we correct their errors. Or when we find them guilty of crimes. 
or anything else. To hold a person responsible is to recognize that the person is a human being and is capable of better. Does our discourse reinforce that we see them all as human beings and better? Or does our discourse distinguish us one from another as those who stand on the side of the angels and those who stand on the side of devils? What does our discourse do? Is our discourse really inclusive? Does it embrace those whom we characterize as having defective amygdalas? Or does it exclude them? What do you think? What is the discourse all about? How many prejudices are we inculcating? How many stereotypes and generalizations are we inculcating by describing the social dynamics and the terms that we use? That's the question. When I said I was prepared to come and do a retrospective, what I meant was I was prepared to come and ask just that question. Are we getting better at relating to human beings as human beings? Or are we only creating greater gulfs between us by inserting pseudoscientific concepts where what's required is direct human expression? I'll give you an example of that. I want to challenge you today. I said this is to be a conversation. I guess I'm only going to get a conversation if I just put things on the table pretty directly and force you to deal with them. There's a word you haven't heard. I, I haven't been to all the sessions. I've been busy. I've been teaching. I've been at board meetings. I have been busy today. So I haven't been to all the sessions. But I'm going to tell you there's one word you haven't heard. There's one response to inclusiveness that nobody has talked about. That is vitally important. One which Aristotle identified 2,000, 3,000, whatever years ago. But nobody talks about it even though they talk about all the divisions in society, the great diversities among us, the reasons we self-segregate, to use the expression I heard in this morning's session, nobody ever says to us, it ought to be our mission in the university to foster intermarriage. Have you heard it? Anyone? No one has heard that. Huh. That is so funny. Even Aristotle realized that you cannot build a community without intermarriage. And therefore he wrote about it. We talk about divisions among us and we never urge intermarriage. Which leads me to ask, how serious are we about overcoming divisions? Tell me. Can you be serious if you're not encouraging intermarriage? I ask you. This is a serious question. Answer me. I, um, I wrote my dissertation on uh, school segregation and religious reasons for school segregation. Yes. And a lot of the discourse coming out of people defending segregation at the time was exactly that. Yes. That they were so worried about yes. how integrating schools would lead to intermarriage exactly. and that it was against God's law. Exactly. And so the fear mongering was all based in that. So. Um, I don't know, it's a, it's a powerful statement <laughs> that you're making right now about that because that language has been deployed so effectively in our history that just hearing yes. the opposite and kind of reconciling how that is not, I mean, no one's seeing the opposite, exactly. right? Exactly. I mean, That's in a way, point. we're still promoting the yes. no intermarriage silently, right? Yes. <laughs> you, you have exactly the point I want you to grasp. And, and I ask others to respond to it. If this is a serious matter, we should be talking about it. Perhaps it's wrong for me to conclude this, but I feel like you're just setting up a straw man with that argument. That, oh, I got more to say. Yeah, so that's, that's good, that's good. But, um, you know, you go back far enough, I wouldn't be here because I am the result of an intermarriage that was banned at one point in mm -hmm. our society. Mm -hmm. So what I advocate for in my work outside of the university is the expansion of rights to others, to grow the sphere of justice and human rights um, and continue to work on the borders of that so people can live their lives freely mm -hmm. in that way. Um, I don't have to be a proponent and say, you should intermarry. Mm -hmm. I need to get out of the way and allow that to happen in the natural human way that mm -hmm. 
it will as folks um, interact in society. Great. Anybody else? Everybody should get in on this. Maybe you don't have to <laughs> talk about it, just do it. I married a white man, and I have two beautiful boys that are uh, Latino, but also white, and they have both last names, and we made sure, uh, we, I made sure that I negotiated that from the get-go, because I think that whole idea of expanding rights is when you expand your culture as well, and it is valued. I think a big part of it is to, you know, uh, build uh, strong, healthy mm -hmm. uh, um, identities on whoever you are. So I think, you know, yes. following it, trying to extend, it, it's, to me, it's just so happened, you know, that I married somebody who was outside my culture. Um, by the way, I'm divorced now. But, <laughs> but for my children's sake, it's an example of that, Did you hear what she said? She said, look, you don't have to preach it, you just have to do it. And of course, it is true, it is being done at an increasing rate. But it is not, in fact, being cultivated. And what I'm underscoring this afternoon is that we who do so much cultivation, we who are subject to so much preaching, we who can't experience a single catastrophe in this country with officials in high office needing to express themselves to the community to show that we all stand on the side of decent human sentiment. This we never cultivate. And here's an interesting thing. Yes, as I said, inter intermarriage is occurring at a vastly increasing rate in our country, silently reshaping the country while we talk about reorganizing the chairs on the Titanic. The people are doing it without cultivation. And guess what? You may conceive that those who are doing it at the greatest pace are those who are the well-educated and those who are, of course, in the nation's privileged classes as a consequence. I, without having done the analysis, I will concede that to you, but I would venture to guess that that would be a mistake, that you would find it's happening at a far faster rate among the uneducated today. I.e., the society is changing before our very eyes and we are not aware of it and we're carrying on the discussion about differences when people are beginning to live beyond difference. That's the reality of the world we live in. The university is not yet acknowledging that reality. People are beginning to live beyond difference while well, we're still preaching the importance of difference. That's the reality. So what I'm asking is, are we singing the right song? Is there a different composition that we ought to be singing? Yes, we mean well, we're very earnest. We've undertaken these extraordinary efforts at reforming ourselves. Perhaps we need to include humility among the elements of the reform that we are undertaking. Perhaps we need to give up trying to infuse people with perspectives about difference and learn from the way in which people are enacting inclusiveness without our guide that just might be a necessary route to take if the university itself is going to continue to strengthen its own mission and to reinforce its integrity of purpose. You see, one of the things that we emphasize at CU is not just inclusiveness, but as we say, inclusive excellence. I don't actually know what that means, but I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> I beg your pardon? The administration doesn't know me. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, well, I told you I, I come in to sing your praises, but not to praise your singing, so... <laughs> yes. I think it, uh, 
the issue we're talking about gets even more complex. You're talking about organizational yes. culture change. What yes. we're talking about here, to a large extent, is change in quote unquote integration at the interpersonal level. I think if a university is going to be successful at introducing successful organizational change, the same precepts that apply in the private sector, which, which, which means clearly define strategic objectives and effectively define mission, mm -hmm. leadership that articulates it, demonstrates it by behavior, and that there's consistent communication about what is important, and then finally you have to measure it. So I think if you're truly talking about institutional change, I think it gets even more complex when you look at it from that perspective. Yes, anybody else want to react to that? What do you think, is it too big for the university, this job? Diversity, inclusion, equity? Can the university handle this job? Yes. I think it starts small. I think even looking at CU Boulder and mm -hmm. acknowledging the fact that we don't have tutoring for all students, that's free. Yes. Um, like, that's not equity. A lot of our students don't have the ability to pay for extra tutoring on the side, and we're allowing them to fail classes. We're allowing them to not be successful because we can't offer free tutoring, which is something that is found in a lot of campuses across the nation. Um, or even in the way, you know, staff and faculty interact with students. Are we really thinking about, do we care about the student? Are we here to help students succeed? Or are we here to put out research? Um, and I think that's a balance that we have to find, especially at a R1 institution. But what does that look like and what does that feel like? And how do we really, I think it's, Again, I think it really starts with something small of like, yes, like something like tutoring. I'm like, just get tutors. Uh, for everybody should have the access to tutoring, yeah. especially if they want to be successful in a class. And so I think about starting small and then getting to the bigger picture or, you know, starting small while everybody else on top figures it out. Um, mm -hmm. But I often think about like social activism and where those movements starts. And it starts with the little people. And so... I don't know. That's all. No, oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. Anybody else? <laughs> I mean, we could put a coda on that last comment by simply observing that the focus was on nurturing excellence by nurturing individuals and taking each one seriously. Uh, that seems like such a bromide, take each person seriously. But how seriously can you take each person? if your primary focus is on treating the person's identity and not the person? How seriously can you take the person when you only greet the person as an identity? Not very, I venture to say. Not very. Now, we are all so very different. And yet, actually not different at all. Not in the least. We come with the same basket of human weaknesses and human potentialities. If excellence means anything, it ought to mean capitalizing in the highest degree possible on the human potentialities. Can I have a comment regarding what you said about taking every person seriously. Mm -hmm. I think even more importantly, or maybe at least equally important, is to take each one of us seriously. Because I think a lot of people do not give themselves credit that they could be the change, change agents that, that we could be. And so I think that makes it so difficult because somehow it's people share their responsibilities and put it on somebody else who doesn't exist because they don't think that they have the agency to make change happen. Mm -hmm when we don't think that we have what it takes. And like I said, when you said you don't give people the credit, but certainly if you don't give yourself the credit that you can do it, that's probably more detrimental than the other one. Okay. Someone else. You know, I was raised in the segregated South. And so there aren't very many of the experiences this country has fretted over for the past seven decades 
that I don't have immediate and personal experience with. And I'm always astounded that when I go to programs like this today and similar things and I listen to people talk about me, that I never identify myself in what they have to say. They never end up explaining the experiences I lived. And they have all kinds of generalizations about it. But I never find that I am represented in the generalizations. For example, I never find my ambition acknowledged in anything that they have to say. I never find the fact that I was not oppressed in my spirit by conditions that were designed to oppress. I never find that acknowledged. All I hear about is victims. I never became a victim. Yes, I lived in the midst of terror, but I never became a victim. And I find that the discourse that drives this kind of event excludes me, doesn't take me into account, doesn't understand how I achieved how I came out of thoroughly segregated education, but nevertheless managed to accomplish at the highest levels. Doesn't understand that I had wonderful teachers, even though they were all black. <laughs> I never find that I am included in the accounts that are given. And the reason for that is because the people who give the accounts find no potential in me. They don't address my potential. They don't address the potential of my children. I remember when Derek Bach and Bill Bowen published The Shape of the River several decades back and they were taking credit for black students at Princeton in particular and how they had done such wonderful work giving them opportunities to bring them into these life-making institutions. I had put two children through Princeton without any scholarship help. And I knew for a fact that Bill Bowen had nothing to do with the fact that my kids were successful. They were incredibly bright people and very accomplished. They got where they got through their accomplishments, not through his preferences. But he wanted to assume that his preferences made the difference in their lives. Therefore, he depreciated their lives when he should have celebrated their lives. We have to be careful about our discourse. We have to be careful at how we structure these terms of identification. Because when we strip the human out of it, what do we end up doing except creating new stereotypes? new prejudices, which over the course of time will turn into implicit biases. Now it's possible to live without prejudice, but only through great effort, only through great exertion. That's what education is about. The irony of all this is that the mission of the university is to eliminate prejudice. That's what the search for truth and open-ended inquiry is all about. And we think that rather than by pushing educational excellence we are eliminating prejudice, we have to establish a parallel set of institutions whose whole mission is somehow to eliminate prejudice but not to educate. And that is oxymoronic. Because where education is happening truly Prejudice is being eliminated. That is the fact of the matter. So if we mean to be really inclusive, we'll ramp up the education. We'll ramp up the challenge in the classroom. We'll ramp up the tutoring. We'll ramp up the mentoring. We'll spend more money on the central mission. And we will accomplish the objective. We won't have to set up separate channels of cultivation that in the end only produce more prejudices. And then I won't have to feel so lonely. <laughs>
Now, there's a little time for questions. Yes, sir. Dr. Presser. <laughs> I hope, William, that this won't take you in a direction you don't want to go, but I'm really, really curious. Um, you alluded a little bit earlier um, to the problem of the law, and mm -hmm. you are uniquely qualified to talk about the law and God and everything else. But, um, what, what I want to know is, do you think that the current action against Harvard is going to be helpful uh, in shifting us toward a search for uh, truth and an absence of prejudice, or is it uh, time ill spent? Well, what are your thoughts? That's a wonderful question. You know, uh, I, I made brief reference to Grutter Gratz and Justice O'Connor, and she sent us, us to 25 years back in 2003. And that 25 years is just about up. And it doesn't seem remotely possible that her dream of ending the reign of preferences by 2023 is going to occur. And so the question is, is this another stage in that process, the suit at Harvard? When I served on the Commission on Civil Rights, and particularly during the time I was chair, I conducted a series of inquiries out in California because the action at that point was at UC Berkeley, where from our investigation it became clear that Asian students were being disadvantaged through the preference regime that was in place. And so I traveled out and I talked to students and faculty and others about what was going on and asked if they had any concern that they were being unfairly disadvantaged in what otherwise was structured as a benign operation. And I discovered back in the end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, that most of the people I talked to were more concerned about the stereotype of the model minority, that is among the Asians, they were more concerned about the stereotype of the model minority than about being the objects of discrimination through preferences. And so they did not in eagerly embrace the opportunity to question what was happening at Berkeley at the time. That it has taken there for 30 years for some students to look up and say, there's something not quite right about this. There's nothing, there's something not quite right about being given a personality characterization <laughs> on the strength of which you're excluded from Harvard, which seems to be too tightly tied to your genetic heritage. That means that maybe there's an awakening not simply in the legal process, but among the victims themselves that didn't previously exist. And if that's the case, then I would suggest it may be the beginning of a process of change in that regard, that it may help set new landmarks in legal interpretation, but more importantly, in social practice. It is simply wrong to go through this process of treating individual applicants for position, whether for admission or appointment, as if they were totems for groups. That's simply wrong. And whenever you're treating some people as totems for groups, you are excluding other people by virtue of the same reasoning. I described in a different publication how this happened in the state of Kentucky many years ago, back in the 80s. Kentucky adopted a very rigorous preference scheme to improve the representation of black people in the state workforce. The black population was roughly 7.2% in the state. And they had less than 4% of the people in the workforce who were black. And so in a course of about three to four years, ambitious, rigorously, they brought that up to 7.2%. So they actually put in place an initiative that changed the dynamics in the state of Kentucky. Then for the next 10 years, it stayed 7.2%. Now, I don't know if there are any statisticians in the room, but if you are, you can tell everyone else what I know. That can't happen by chance. It can't. Impossible. The reality is, they were, having reached the cap, discriminating against black people. That's what that number means. They reported it as a sign of progress 
and accomplishment, it was actually the evidence of ongoing discrimination against black people, which is easy to explain because from the beginning of the 20th century, black people, men and women, had participated in the workforce at a far higher rate than anybody else. Therefore, to calculate their relative population percentage as a fair rate of participation in the workforce would be cutting them short. Since they participated at a much higher rate, if you were going to use this kind of quota scheme, they should have been present far beyond their participation in the population as a whole. So they were discriminating against them. This is an inevitable consequence of all such schemes. But bringing it to people's attention is exceedingly difficult. For people are invested in their explanations of social relations. And when they have power, they impose their explanations of social relations on everybody else. We wonder where prejudices come from. Prejudices always come from the people in power. Now, I'll leave you to figure out who's in power in the 21st century, but I will tell you, prejudices always come from the people in power, not from anywhere else. Don't believe the old redneck story. That's not where it comes from. It's the people in charge who are responsible for all the prejudices that prevail in the society. So yes, Dr. Presser, I, I think this could be a moment for some reckoning. Uh, it's going to take a long time before it reaches that stage, I think. Anybody else? Questions? Well, let me just summarize then. Uh, you've been very good. You've humored me. I appreciate that. I, uh, I would have prepared a formal presentation for you, but I thought this was tomorrow. And I saved the time for doing that for tonight. <laughs> I woke up this morning and said, oops. <laughs> but I wouldn't have done much differently than I have done. Because my whole point was to bring an emphasis that says, let's not undermine the intentions of those who have said the university needs to take on this important work. Let's affirm their best intentions. But let's also give some direction to those intentions. Let's ask them to rise to the challenge of understanding what the mission of the university truly is. We are not here to make objects of one another, objects of reform for one another. We are here to engage in a common enterprise of seeking the truth. We need to guarantee open-ended inquiry, and with that, the corollary free expression. We need to assure that there are among us people who will challenge our dearest held assumptions. And that is for our own good. It is not that we need to be challenged because those who can challenge us require representation. There is no representation principle that applies in education. The only principle that applies in education is capacity. And we should insist that that principle be applied down the line. I even go so far, I will tell you, as to challenge universities thinking they have a right to pick and choose who can come. I dispute their claim to that authority. They have a right to set standards. And whoever meets the standard first past the post ought to be in. But we've got a long way to go to get to that ideal state of existence. For they still think it's their job to create a profile, <laughs> to pick and choose who belongs in each class, etc. That is perhaps the greatest prejudice we have to deal with to overcome the assumption that their job is to structure social relationships. It isn't. It's just to facilitate learning. Thank you.